Hello science fans and welcome to Shiansha. Our topic for today is building your methodology. A common misconception about writing the methodology is that it's just as simple as paraphrasing published methods or protocols in manuals. But to be precise, in order for you to write a good methodology, you have to factor in the five key components of a good experiment. Those are the hypothesis, the experimental design, the experimental execution, statistical analysis, and interpretation. At the risk of redundancy, I've featured the hypothesis in many of my videos. And this is because it is of primary importance. If your hypothesis is not good and clearly established, then even if your experiment is properly executed, then it would be of little value. Think of your hypothesis as the compass that sets the direction of your research. In our previous video on the introduction, we referenced our paper on the effect of acid rain on the growth of mung bean plants. Let me reiterate the hypothesis of the study. It states that acid rain removes nutrients from the soil and will thus lead to the decreased growth of plants exposed to acid rain. This hypothesis will be the one tested in the experiment that I will be describing. Before writing your methodology, you have to first establish your experimental design, which is the logical construct of your experiment. This is largely based on your objectives and it contains the following features. First, the nature of the experimental units to be employed. An experimental unit is the entity subjected to an intervention independently of all other units. This could be an organism, it could be a type of tissue, it could be a bodily fluid, and so on. The second factor includes the number and kinds of treatments, including controls, that you are going to perform. In an experiment, the treatment usually refers to the set of independent variables that you are going to manipulate to see an effect on your experimental units. Third, the properties or responses of the experimental units to be measured. This could be factors such as weight, height, and other factors for growth. It could be levels of certain kinds of chemicals, and so on. Fourth how experimental treatments are assigned to each unit. And an important factor here is randomization, mostly because randomization limits bias and at the same time, it prevents systematic errors, which we will be discussing later. Next, you have the physical arrangement of the experimental units themselves. This is not just a logistical issue, but can also factor in limiting errors and biases in your experiments as well. And finally, the sequence by which treatments are applied and measurements made on the experimental units. This would be referring to the timeline of your experiments as to when you're going to be applying the treatments, how you're going to apply them, and when you will measure the effect on the experimental units themselves. For concrete examples of the different factors involved in making your experimental design, let's go back to our mung bean study. If you look at the objectives on the slide, these already provide information as to certain features of the experimental design. For example, the nature of the experimental units to be employed would be the mung bean plants themselves. When it comes to the number and kinds of treatments that will be used in the experiment, we have two, with and without acid rain. In this case, the treatment that is without acid rain would be our negative control because we want to see the difference between the growth of plants grown when exposed to acid rain and those that are not. Third, the properties or responses of the experimental units to be measured are also already indicated in the objectives and they are specifically shoot and root length, water, organic and inorganic content of the mung bean plants. And finally, the sequence by which treatments are applied and measurements made on the experimental units are also indicated. This would be that the treatments will be 
applied onto the plants for 120 days. And then eventually, some plants will be sacrificed every 5 to 7 days to see the effects of acid rain at the different developmental stages of the plant. So what's left now would be the method of randomization or assignment of the experimental units to the different treatments as well as the physical setup of the experiment. Before we talk about how randomization can be done in an experiment, let us first define what randomization is. Randomization is a process that ensures every experimental unit has an equal chance of being assigned to a treatment. In the mung bean experiment, each seed could have a different capacity for growth, and there is little that can be done to check this at the onset of the experiment. To minimize the possible bias this could lead to in the experiment, each seed, and therefore each plant grows from it, is randomly assigned to a different treatment group. Simple randomization just means that you assign an organism or an experimental unit to a different treatment in a non-biased manner. It could be as simple as writing the organism name in a piece of paper, putting them in a hat, and throwing one piece of paper at a time to determine which goes to which treatment. It can also be done using software or simple programs or even your scientific calculator. But to show you how this was done in our experiment, let's look at the diagram behind me. So here we see six plants out of the 120 that we used in the experiment. In the experiment, we have two treatments those that are exposed to acid rain and those that are not exposed to acid rain. As you can see, instead of assigning plants 1, 2, 3 to one treatment and plants 4, 5, and 6 to the other, each plant was randomly assigned using a computer-based randomizer. So it ended up that plants 3, 5, and 6 are those that will be exposed to acid rain, while plants 1, 2, and 4 are those that are not exposed to acid rain. Now when it comes to designing the setup in the room that we will be using, if we have three tables, we can't just put all the treatments with acid rain on one table and all the treatments without acid rain on another. This is even if we try to regulate temperature, humidity, and light in all corners of the room, there can be random factors that would affect the condition in one area over the other. So to minimize this, even the location of the plants will be randomized in the room. So, as you can see, using the same computer-based randomizer, plants 1 and 3 are those placed on table 1, while plants 2 and 4 are in table 2, and plants 6 and 5 are in table 3. For the results of an experiment to be valid, we have to ensure that they happen consistently and repeatedly. And in order to do this, we factor in replicates and subsamples. A replicate, in the biological sense, is an exact copy of a sample or an experimental unit that is being analyzed. It could be a cell, an organism, or a molecule which experiences the same procedure as those of the others. A subsample, on the other hand, is done in order to enhance accuracy and precision of the method on multiple portions of the data. So for example, an organism could be a replicate, whereas three tissue samples from that organism would represent three subsamples. So a subsample of one replicate is not necessarily independent of each other. It's usually employed to check the precision of the method. In the mung bean experiment, when we did our preliminary run, we realized that a single plant has a very low mass to allow for downstream analysis that involves determination of organic and inorganic components. So to factor this in, we changed our experimental design. So from the diagram, you will now see two rectangles that contain six plants each. Now, instead of having one plant as a replicate, each pot is now a replicate with each plant inside as a subsample. So, 
when we allocated for the location or the physical design of the experiment, each pot is now randomly assigned a different location in the room. So again, for this experiment, the pot is the replicate, while each plant inside the pot is a subsample of that particular experimental unit. So now you have your experimental design ready. You went ahead and purchased the equipment and materials that you need, and you're all set to do the experiment. So please take note, when you're ready to execute the experiment, there are certain key factors to remember. First, make sure to employ good judgment. And good judgment is more or less just linked to common sense. But it's also heavily based on previous knowledge on doing the experiment. So again, let me re-emphasize this. Your RRL will be very important. Now, when you think you don't have enough good judgment, that's when you start talking to people, particularly your advisor or a senior scientist, to help you judge on what to do next. Of course, you should have enough technical skills to perform the experiment, and if you're not confident with what you currently know, then perhaps you should consider undergoing workshops or trainings before starting the experiment. Then, the last two, once you have all the skills and all the judgment that you need, you still have to prevent systematic errors and avoid random errors. Please take note of the words that we use. A systematic error leads to predictable and consistent departures from the true value due to problems in equipment or your performance of the experiment. And a systematic error can be prevented by proper training and the use of proper equipment. So these things you can prevent because the moment systematic error plays into your experiment, then this makes your data questionable. On the other hand, random errors are those that lead to fluctuations around the true value as a result of difficulty in taking measurements. This could be issues of random fluctuations in temperature that you can't really avoid. It could also be issues on the organism itself. Sometimes you can't avoid it, sometimes you can. But for the instances that you can, you should be aware of their existence so that you minimize their infiltration of your data. Since we're already talking about random errors, there is one common source of random errors in an experiment, and that is heterogeneity. Now, heterogeneity refers to the differences that are already present in your experimental units. But of course, since we already are aware of this, there is also such a thing as allowable heterogeneity. And decisions as to what degree of initial heterogeneity among experimental units is permissible and about which extent to which one should attempt to regulate environmental conditions during the experiment remains to be subjective. These decisions, however, will affect the magnitude of random error and therefore the sensitivity of an experiment. As much as possible, try not to decide on this alone. You need as much consultation as possible because different views could allow you to make a better approximation of allowable heterogeneity than your own judgment alone. More often than not, you would hear students and scientists tell you that they can increase the accuracy of their study by doing more replication. However, more replication can also lead to more error if you're not careful. So how much replication is enough replication? So in your study, there will be such things as technical replicates and biological replicates. Technical replicates allow you to be aware of possible systematic and random errors that you're doing in the execution of the experiment. It shows you the consistency of your use of the experimental techniques in creating the same results. So technically, a technical replicate is a subsample. A biological replicate, on the other hand, shows you that the response that you're looking for in the organism occurs consistently across different individuals. 
this is your true replicate. In order for you to know if your replication is enough, one thing that you can do is to do a power analysis. I will put a link down the description of this video onto a procedure as to how to do a power analysis. Once you have your data collected, the next sometimes painful step is to do your statistical analysis. Now, the kind of statistical analysis that you're going to employ is dependent on what you're trying to compare. For example, if you're trying to compare two groups and you're dealing with continuous variables, you can do an independent t-test. However, if you're doing a categorical assignment of variables such as red, black, blue, or dominant versus recessive, and so on and so forth, you can do a chi-square test. And finally, if you're dealing with ordinal variables that have a non-normal distribution, you can use a man whitney u test followed by a median test. On the other hand, if you're dealing with more than two groups, continuous variables are often analyzed using ANOVA with subsequent t-tests or post hoc tests checked which causes the significant differences. And if you're dealing with more than two groups, sometimes a modified chi-square test can be done for categorical variables. And then finally, if you are dealing with ordinal variables that have non-normal distribution, you can do a Kruskal-Wallis test followed by an ANOVA. So prior to doing your statistical test, let's go back to your hypothesis. I know this is getting too repetitive, but remember, this is the compass and the backbone of your experiment. So remember, we have an experimental hypothesis that was present in your introduction. When you're doing your statistical test, you now have to refine your experimental hypothesis into a statistical hypothesis. Remember, the statistical hypothesis has two components, your null and your alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis often states the lack of significant differences in your data sets, whereas the alternate hypothesis is the opposite. Once you perform your statistical tests, whether you're doing it manually or with the use of a program, it will often give you a large number of values to interpret. But one of the easiest and quickest way to do this is to look at the p-value. The p-value indicates whether you have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And usually, the smaller the p-value, the stronger this evidence is. Normally, if the p-value is less than 0.05, this means that your data is statistically significant. And if your data shows statistical significance in difference, then it means that the null hypothesis is rejected and the alternative hypothesis is accepted. So now that you've completed your experiment, time to reflect on how you're supposed to write your methodology. One thing to remember is that a picture paints a thousand words. So rather than creating a worthy methodology, take time to create diagrams or illustrations of how you plan to do the experiment because this will allow your reader to understand what you want to do better. Also, don't be tempted to turn your methodology into a daily log or a diary. Instead of telling your reader how you perform the experiment on a day-to-day -day or a timeline basis, categorize your steps into specific portions of your structural framework. If you look at the comparison on the screen, Instead of telling the readers what we did on day one, day two, or day three, a better writing is to cluster the different steps that we did when we prepared the artificial acid rain, and then in the germination of the mundane plants, and so on and so forth. When writing the methodology, you also always have to be aware of your tenses. If you're writing a proposal, make sure that your methodology is in future tense. On the other hand, if you're writing a scientific report or a scientific journal, make sure that your methodology has been converted to past tense. So that wraps up our short video on writing your methodology. I hope this has given you essential information that will allow you to create a good and robust experimental design for your experiments. 
If you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to let me, your resident Filipina scientist, know in the comments section below. Also, please like this video for more science goodness and please subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much and see you around!